Welcome to Houston House at South by Southwest. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy launched the American Space Program from Rice University in Houston, where he proudly proclaimed to the world that the U.S. would land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. This bold challenge led to an unprecedented program of scientific exploration. For over 60 years, NASA has positioned the U.S. as a leader in space technology and exploration. And Johnson Space Center, one of NASA's largest R&D facilities, has made Houston the epicenter of human space exploration. But as their capabilities have grown, so has their task list. With a trillion-dollar space economy on the horizon, NASA's continued mission to put people in space, sustainably and at scale, marks the beginning of a new era of cooperation with private firms. Many of these partnerships are taking place at the Houston Spaceport, which is serving as a catalyst for growth in the commercial space sector. Join leaders from NASA and some of the most prominent space startups today for an insightful discussion on how public and private cooperation is enabling the next frontier of space exploration. This panel is presented by Houston Spaceport. Hope uh, you guys are as excited as I am. A lot of things happening in commercial space and uh, the city of Houston, uh, the, the Houston Spaceport is uh, so proud of being part of uh, what's going on here. We could just not have been uh, uh, somewhere else while all this was happening. Um, myself, um, I've been working uh, with the Houston Spaceport Development since the inception of the, the plan. That's uh, 12, uh, 10 years ago exactly in 2012. Uh, today, uh, I am so proud to uh, be able to state that from what used to be just a concept, a, um, an idea, a paper uh, spaceport, uh, we have turned now into a full reality that is uh, having a very significant uh, impact in what's going on in the industry, in the, in the commercial space uh, industry. Uh, obviously, uh, our role is one that uh, uh, is aligned with uh, the development of infrastructure, creating the conditions so that uh, commercial companies can thrive and can come and do what they do in Houston. Uh, we're so fortunate to have companies like uh, the ones represented by Axiom, by Intuitive Machines, of course, uh, to have Johnson Space Center at the, at the epicenter of our, of our activity, right? And uh, we intend to take full advantage of what's going on. Um, we've made tremendous progress. Uh, we went, uh, as I mentioned, from uh, ideas to now actively uh, having planetary uh, low Earth orbit lunar activities happening at the Houston Spaceport. But that's, uh, that's just a quick introduction. Uh, let me allow uh, for each one of the panelists here to introduce themselves so, so that you know who you'll be hearing from. Uh, go ahead, Matt, please. All right, good afternoon. I'm Matt Ondler. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Director of Engineering at Axiom Space. Uh, Axiom Space is building the world's first commercial space station. Uh, it'll be completely uh, funded uh, uh, privately, and uh, two years ago we won the opportunity to build our space station off of the International Space Station. So it's uh, designed to be a replacement for ISS and then go so much uh, farther beyond that. And uh, I'm really excited about uh, this month because we'll be breaking ground at the spaceport for our new facility and building our new facility. And, and in that facility, uh, remarkably enough, in the storied history of uh, JSC, it will be the first place where a spacecraft is fully assembled and, and put into space uh, at that uh, facility at the spaceport. I'm Tim Crane. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer at uh, Intuitive Machines. Uh, we were founded in 2013 actually as a, a think tank um, to take NASA engineering approaches out uh, across multiple sectors. But in 2018, NASA established the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, and we pivoted and fell back into our original passion and uh, now we have won uh, three payloads on that mission, and uh, we are part of developing commercial transportation data and infrastructure to the moon, and it's an evolution of, of NASA's business model that we're, we're really pleased to be a part of. We have a building that's actually in construction now at the Houston Spaceport. Uh, Arturo and the uh, Houston Airport System have been incredible partners, uh, as has the Johnson Space Center, and so we really have, have helped be a part of a, a 
philosophy within the community to reinvigorate space exploration from Houston. And uh, it's an exciting time to be uh, an engineer working in that area. Uh, we'll play to the home crowd a little bit. I did get my, uh, my degrees from the University of Texas in the 90s. <laughs> and uh, it's a little bit of a bucket list item for me to be a part of South by Southwest, uh, although I thought I'd be doing it playing bass. And so uh, <laughs> you, know, you, you settle. Anyways, thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Douglas Terrier. I'm the Associate Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center, and I'm super excited to be here at South by Southwest, my first time. Um, my role really at JSC is, in addition to leading the center, is to really transform us from the 60-year storied history of exploration and leading the nation and the world in human space exploration into the, the 21st century version of, of what we're, what's ahead of us, which I promise you is much more exciting than the, the past. And a lot of that is around the fact that we're going from a model of where we had primarily government-funded um, interest in space to one that's going to be focused a lot on the commercial sector, a lot of private sector investment, a lot of commercial opportunities for businesses that we can't even imagine just even yet. Um, obviously, Axiom um, intuitive machines are great examples. SpaceX down in Boca Chica and, and in, uh, up in McGregor, are, are, and we have more and more people coming into the state. But, uh, fundamentally, our goal is to be able to leverage that private sector investment to help us do more, to go further, and to maintain American leadership in what is now easily the most important and contested environment, the next frontier, strategically and economically. Cisco Lunar Space is the most important frontier for the United States to continue to have world leadership in. Our goal is to ensure that we continue to do that in a new model that involves harnessing the innovation and the expertise from both inside and outside of NASA in the community represented here and in many of you out here, how we can work together to continue to ensure that what happened when I was eight years old is I heard Houston Tranquility Base, the Eagle has landed. Houston was the first word spoken from the surface of another world. Uh, we want to ensure that when we land on the moon again in our Artemis program coming up, and when we land on Mars, and as we go out into the solar system, that Houston and Texas continue to be the center and the hub for driving that innovation and that exploration outward. So that's our goal, and we're glad to be here to share that vision with you. Thank you, gentlemen. It's, you, you guys are amazing. You know, as you were going through your introduction, I was thinking, I, I am really, I am so proud, and I am, you know, humble to, to be. Uh, sitting here next to you. You guys are the doers. You are the people that are getting things done. Johnson Space Center, Intuitive Machine, Axiom. You're the guys uh, making it happen, moving us into the, the commercial space, right? When we talk about commercial spaces here, I am sure that by now, nobody has a doubt that, that that's what we are today, right? We, we have now, we were just talking prior to the, you know, to, to the start of the panel, we were just saying how, how important it is for companies and for those connected to this industry to start finding the ways to become more, more productive, to, to become really uh, you know, a commercial entity that will return the, the investment uh, to those uh, gambling in the future of uh, what we're doing all together here. Uh, from our perspective, from the perspective of the city of Houston, I uh, believe that by now, after 10 years, you guys uh, can rest assured that, that the city of Houston is committed, is committed to the future, and uh, um, as we have done from uh, the 1960s, late, late 1950s, we have been uh, supportive of the uh, this space flight industry. Uh, today, as we move into the commercial era, we are uh, doing the same thing. We're supporting it, and not just with wars, not just with, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, words of incentive, with, uh, with real investment that uh, has now moved us into uh, the creation of this uh, new commercial spaceport that is a full reality. Now we're gonna uh, get moving with some general questions. Uh, you guys, the, the rule to answer is that there is no rule. Please uh, <laughs> uh, feel free to, to um, interject, to, to answer as you see fit. Uh, we have some general, general questions that I'm uh, hoping that you uh, help our audience uh, and help us all better understand. Uh, the first one is one is, uh, the question that I have is where does, can you guys help us understand where the, the US space industry stands today? And uh, how is that um, connected to your business? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, we're really at this uh, inflection point or this place where uh, access to space is easier. Uh, companies are emerging where it's not just NASA and big companies like Boeing and Lockheed that can participate in space. Uh, I think our company is a great example. Um, just because of advances in technology and sometimes just thinking about the problem in a different way, we're going to build our first commercial space station uh, for a cost of about a hundred to a thousand times less than what it costs to build the ISS, which is really sort of hard to get your head around. In some ways, it's not a fair comparison. The ISS uh, was a, a forced marriage between the U.S. and the Russians, which certainly added a great deal of complexity. And there were other reasons why it, it cost as much as it, as it did. But really taking advantage of, of technologies uh, is really enabling this commercial space. It's very similar or analogous to the beginning of the Internet. There were a few key technologies that really allowed the Internet uh, to explode. And so there's a few things uh, in aerospace that are really allowing uh, commercial space to, to take off. And we think that the low Earth orbit economy is a trillion dollar economy, whether it's uh, bioprinting uh, organs, whether it's uh, making special fiber optic cable. I I'm completely convinced that 15 to 20 years from now, we're gonna be surrounded by objects that we can't imagine how we lived without that were manufactured in space. And so I think uh, it's a bright future uh, for aerospace, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely a, a time of transition and, and opportunity where um, low Earth orbit, we, we see commercialization in low Earth orbit, we see commercialization in geo. And now we're reaching out to the moon, and, and NASA is, is still providing leadership, but because the access to um, launch costs is more regularized, more affordable, because the ability to provide infrastructure, how do we get the data down from the moon, how do we, um, how do we deliver payloads also on a regular basis and change the paradigm from, hey, this is one exquisite mission that will work four years and we'll do it and then we're done and we go on the next thing, to one more like, we have four launches a year going to the moon to take payloads and do more science. The opportunities for companies to come up with new ideas and new ways to approach that and then to provide opportunities with NASA to scientists and innovators as payload partners, as communication systems development partners, and take a lot of the best thoughts we have here on Earth and explore them in a new space that's a frontier, not just for the fact that it's at the moon, um, but it's, a, it's an economic frontier too. So what are the different kinds of ecosystems of companies that work together that we can borrow from the best models we have here and, and establish new capabilities and really become a permanent species out into the solar system, uh, science fiction, until it's not. Yeah, and if I could add to that, one thing I want to make clear to everyone is that we're kind of talking in future tense, but it's important to realize that today the space economy is over $400 billion. A lot of people don't realize that, but every aspect of your life depends on it, from precision timing for your bank transactions, to keeping the power grid working, to GPS that probably you used to get here. We kind of, it's kind of just ubiquitous in our lives, and we don't even realize it already, and it is an extremely viable of that 400 billion, by the way, only about a quarter of that is government investments across the globe. Most of it is self-sustaining private sector concerns that are doing just fine, making a business case. And that, that, that's another point I want to make sure is clear is that the reason we are in a very um, synergistic partnership with these start, you know, new companies in space and existing space companies is because there, there are really two roles. We mentioned uh, President Kennedy's speech at Rice the formation of NASA in 1958, actually the Space Act Agreement calls out two roles for NASA. The first being the one you know about, to explore space and do the science and technology and find out what's out there. The second one is to create the conditions for commercial success for the United States in space. So we're going to talk about that one a lot today. And that is a vital part of our mission, not a secondary part of what NASA's mission is. And it works, it, it work, it's actually synergistic in the sense that the more we have um, more companies operating in space, the more of an industrial base we can call on, as Tim said, driving the price down, amortizing the access to space so that NASA doesn't have to bear that cost, so we take advantage of it. So it creates a role where there's, there, are, there are things like exploring outer planets for which there isn't a business case. Clearly the government needs to take the lead there in the technologies and the approaches to that. 
And then there are things where we're, we're now commercializing low Earth orbit, moving that to the moon, and that is success for everybody. And we benefit by being able to then buy those, those uh, services as a commodity. Excellent. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty, pretty impressive. As, as you guys were uh, answering, I was uh, thinking, and you, you, you heard this comparison many times before, it is uh, almost uh, not possible not to compare, for me at least, uh, the aerospace industry with uh, aviation. And uh, uh, to me, what we stand today is that in that very early stage, right, of uh, aerospace, of what, you know, where aviation was in the, in the 1920s, exactly. things were just beginning. Um, it, it is incredible now to think that uh, the world is a very different place because of aviation. I can just see how the, the world is going to be a very, very different place because of aerospace and uh, because of uh, you know the ability to be able to to go to other places, bring technology, develop technology, um, do things that today today we have no idea are possible, right? And so um, we are fully fully engaged, right, and looking forward to to the progress that you guys are making in each one in your industry. You know, Arturo, just just to give an example of what you just said, uh, and Douglas brought this up when we were, we were talking before. How many people have heard of NACA? Not NASA, but NACA, N-A-C-A. A few here and there, but that was NASA for aviation in the 20s, and an investment the government made to do the technologies that we needed to move aircraft travel, air travel safely into commercial hands. And then once it went commercial, we never looked back. Now you don't even know NACA. So I'd hope in 70 years, NASA is a historical uh, <laughs> activity. I mean, Na NASA used to fund intuitive machines, but that's how we get to the moon regularly. So yeah. It, yeah. it's, the history shows us this can work. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and I'd add too, the only reason we can build a commercial space station is because of 25 years of flying the International Space Station and all the things that we've learned from NASA and that NASA has learned in keeping humans alive for, for long periods of time. And so we're, we're really leveraging so much history and so much of the government's investment to build our commercial space station. Amazing. Uh, you made me think of uh, the times when uh, back in the 60s, I remember seeing a coupon. Not that I saw it personally, right? But, but uh, um, somebody talked about Hilton selling uh, hotel nights uh, in, in, on the moon, right? Yeah. And uh, I am sure that with the commercial space station that Axiom is building, we're a lot closer to uh, having the Hiltons, the Marriott's, uh, get, get, getting us up there in their hotels, yeah. right? But uh, moving forward, uh, let, me, let me ask you guys, what are some of the key opportunities and challenges uh, for, for growth in the, in the sector that you, you guys see? Yeah, I, you know, there's just tremendous opportunities for sure. You know, we need engineers of all kinds and, and, and infrastructure of all kinds. You know, an interesting uh, phenomenon going on in the world right now is that uh, in space, um, you have to be able to build your electronics to survive the radiation environment. And so you test all your electronics at various facilities that uh, can do that radiation testing. Uh, a lot because of COVID, but also because of demand, a lot of those facilities are shutting down. So even those services, we used to actually go to uh, uh, the Memorial Hospital. They had a, a place where when they weren't doing uh, cancer treatments, you could take your electronics in there. Um, but that service is no longer available. So, so even businesses you can't even imagine uh, uh, are really needed for, for space. And then there's just all the other things, you know, especially materials and machining. That's why I love being in Houston, um, there's so much industrial base, so much industrial infrastructure, and we need all of those things. You know, it's not only engineering, but it's also manufacturing and, and all those sort of things too. And then the other final port is we're gonna fly a lot of payloads, uh, research payloads, but also we hope to one day figure out lots of things to manufacture. And so one of the really promising things is to be able to do bioprinting in microgravity and so being again in Houston with uh, access to the medical center we think there's lots of opportunities for for those developments as well yeah we definitely stand on the shoulder of the great work that uh, the space community has done till now in terms of technologies you know if you think about going to the moon and, and Apollo that was an era um, where you had to invent everything you had to invent the booster you had to invent the materials you had to invent the computers and now we have a terrestrial technology base that we can sample from and then, and then do testing for things that weren't 
necessarily intended for space and, and go dual use. So the more we can make our supply chain not custom parts, but things that have use already in a, in a terrestrial market, you know, the better off we are. Um, and opportunities then to network. You know, we talked to Grace from BP earlier, and, and to peek over the fence at what the energy sector is doing, what the tech sector is doing, and say, hey, how can I combine um, what you are, are putting together terrestrially, maybe not even from a technological point of view, but from a business point of view. That's, that's a challenge from the aerospace model that it's new thinking for us. And so, so getting into that mindset of figuring out how to, how to go to commercialization from this one mission at a time is, is an interesting place to be. I'd also say that, um, I totally lost my thought. Yeah. Spaced out. Yeah. <laughs> um, Those UT guys. I know, right? <laughs> uh, so South Congress too late last night. <laughs> It'll come back to me, go ahead. All right. Well, well, I'll just I'll just pick up on it, Tim. Um, I, you know, so something that I think is really important for maybe may, maybe all of you know this, maybe some of you don't know this, but since um, like whenever I talk to high school kids, I'm always impressed with the fact that they have been born into a world where not all humans live on this planet. Because for the last 20 years, humans have lived on the International Space Station continuously. Um, my grandchildren are going to live in a world where humans live on the moon, where they'll get a nightly news broadcast from the moon. I mean, the, the opportunities are just from a societal and, and uh, civilization changing standpoint is, is beyond, is, is actually beyond comprehension. Um, but one of the things when you talked about opportunities, we really need to remind everybody that we spent a lot of money getting to space. As, as Matt and Tim said, it's really, really hard, really challenging. But what it does is it pushes forward all these things we have to invent. And they find their ways into applications in medicine, in water purification, in clean energy that return tenfold. Um, value to our society, to sectors that you would be really, really surprised. I, I learned 90% of all the infant formula in the United States sold today contains a fatty acid substitute that was developed to combat some of the issues that we have with, with astronauts on orbit. So NASA paid to develop that. It's found its way into baby formula because it, um, you know, it promotes eye, eye growth and brain tissue growth and so on. Just the the spin-offs are really an important part. What we're doing right now is we've kind of got over that first hurdle where we've commercialized operations to low Earth orbit. So all transportation of crew and cargo to the low, low Earth orbit is a commercial venture NASA buys from the community. That frees us up to look further. We're now going with the Artemis program, going returning to the moon to live and stay, permanently establish a presence on the moon, and more importantly, use that as a gateway to go further into the solar system. So we fully expect and, and encourage and partnered with our, our uh, industrial partners to then extend that commercial model to the moon. If you can imagine mining commodities on the moon and having uh, literally a refueling station, a replenishment station, you know, you actually don't t load up your wagons in Virginia and go to San Francisco. You stop in St. Louis and reprovision. And, and people build a general store and they build a, uh, you know, an economy around that. That's what we're doing as we stage our exploration out into, into space. So the challenges are many. But I think it creates opportunities that we can't, just as we couldn't imagine that cell phone in our pocket and the GPS we're using, Apollo did not set out to make that, but they invented things that created that. They certainly did not intend to create Uber, but it doesn't exist without that. And you, we can't even predict what we will, what we will be able to, to, to generate, not just in space, but on Earth, in the economy, in a better quality of life from the, the technologies we're going to develop in space. I remember what it was. <laughs> Manufacturing, um, and, and you know, we have at Intuitive Machines three missions on the books right now. We're planning our, our fourth. So our mindset had to shift from, well, let's, let's pour all in on building this first lander and doing it the first time to already looking at the second lander and what are the differences between the two and how do we regularize that production in a way that right now our design is, is the core of that vehicle is basically the same from flight to flight. And then the panels, we have six panels that go on a, on a hexagonal kind of structure. Those are kind of like, um, you know, like theater false walls that we put the payloads and solar panels on, for whatever the customers need. But being able to manufacture in that way allows us to build the core vehicle the same way over and over and over again. But thinking about the manufacturing process in addition to just a one-time mission is something that's very important to us and is a, a new way of thinking for NASA veterans like myself and, and these guys, you know, how do you build them 
So you build another one and another one and another one and another one the same. And I, Matt, I don't know how much that's in y'all's thought space with Axiom, but. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, and, and Elon Musk actually says this too. Engineering is hard, but it's the manufacturing that's hard. Uh, and especially when you're building something really large, the, the handling fixtures, the tooling, those are engineering marvels as well. And so being able to build things very inexpensively and cheaply is important. One thing that Douglas said about the human element I wanted to follow up on because one of our markets is flying uh, private astronauts. And um, we're seeing a lot of customers that are um, from countries that want to participate in space because most countries in the world see that that is the, the future, as Douglas said earlier. And so it's countries like Hungary and uh, United Arab Emirates, Turkey, countries that don't necessarily participate in the ISS. And one of the things that we believe is that um, the more people you can get in space, the better world you have. There's this phenomenon that many uh, astronauts uh, have come back with. It's called the overview effect. It is this sort of profound change in how you look at the world when you see the world uh, from space. And so the more people, you know, we want to democratize space, the more people we can get up in space and then see the world a little differently, right? Where they don't see that Brazil is green and Paraguay is yellow and Uruguay is uh, purple, right? That they see it as one world. We think is a profound, potentially world-changing uh, event as well. Yeah, and, and it's not as profound when you send a scientific instrument up uh, for, for someone else, but the same thought of, of opening up participation and being able to go to a university in um, you know, Brazil or Australia or Nigeria and saying, we're going to the moon and I've got 20 kilograms of payload space left over, the mission is already set. If you've got a university that wants to do a five kilogram experiment, you don't have to worry about arranging the launch or the tracking on the way to get there or the data down or the power once you land. We'll take care of you and you can do science on the moon. So maybe not as, as personally visceral as a person going up into space, but in a way, get those science communities and those academic communities um, able to buy pieces of these, these transportation capabilities to the moon um, even with NASA as our anchor customer, there's still that room to, to provide and make it easy for them to do science then that they can be proud of as a, as a university, as a space program on their own. So their sovereign you know, development participation is still real. We just maybe took care of some of the transportation burden so you could focus on new science. Thank you, Tim. Uh, you know, as you guys were talking, I was I think, how is this even possible? You know, we're, we're sitting here, we're talking about uh, this uh, new commercial era, right? And uh, what is it? Are we are we that smart that all of a sudden we just decide, hey, we're gonna we're gonna go into space and we will do it, or uh, help the audience see it? Isn't it true that uh, the achievements that uh, each one of you companies, right, and many other companies in the space business are relying on the foundation that has been set by the federal government, by the, the governments around the world, right, that have supported uh, this uh, space industry. I think that that's a, you know, it is fair to bring up because uh, as you were, uh, you know, as you were making a reference to NACA and NASA, right, yeah, one, one day, one day that's gonna happen, right, we're gonna see where, uh, we, we have the commercial entities dominating uh, travel to and, and um, you know, from space. But today, today, you know, we have been able to get here because of the efforts that uh, the governments have uh, put behind uh, space, right? And, and that's how we, how we uh, are able to do it. Uh, again, uh, to me, to me uh, when I think about the Houston Space Board, and think about the fact that it was just uh, summer of 2015 when we got our license to operate as a, a, a horizontal operations type of spaceport, right? Uh, to think, to think that today, today we're building a spacecraft, the largest one, the space station, right? Uh, unmanned uh, systems going to the moon in two or three months. To me, that's that's just incredible. It's uh, amazing. But the question and help the audience understand how is that possible? How how, how have you been able to do that? No, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, it's a question I answer a lot. Uh, as I mentioned, we're raising uh, venture capital, and so every venture capitalist says, well, how is it possible you can build a space station for so much less than the historic ISS? 
And a lot of it is the 20 years, as Douglas said, of keeping humans alive on the space station. We learned so much, so much technology has been developed from that. Some of it is, and is actually access to personal expertise at NASA. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our modules is we call the Earth Observatory. It's the largest space window in the solar system, or will be. Uh, it's by far the largest space window ever attempted. And uh, we have a test rig. Uh, uh, so imagine a window. The window is seven feet by three feet. But when you have vacuum on one side and atmospheric pressure on the other, it's the equivalent of eight SUVs sitting on the window. So the forces are enormous. Well, uh, I had a young engineer design this test apparatus so that we could prove to ourselves that we could build such a window. But he had access to the window expert at NASA. So she has worked every space window from shuttle to space station. And her interest, of course, was in the material that we're using for, for her projects. But her expertise, just her helping that one engineer in that one little area allowed him to design uh, a really good window on his first try. And, and, and then that's just one example of thousands uh, across uh, NASA that there's just so much expertise, so many technologies developed that are directly applicable to, to what we're doing. Innovation and that the ability to commercially engage in space also requires a lot of ideas um, and a lot of new ways to look at things. And so um, having a growing community around the Johnson Space Center and at the Houston Spaceport, where in a way we'll, we'll have more minds and more companies working together, and probably people changing badges over the years, where you'll be a contractor or you'll work for IM or you'll work for Axiom, you'll go back to the civil service. And having that critical mass of, of new thought to explore the ideas of, of how we can commercialize things. This is not one idea. It's, it's a number of ideas. And just look at the tech sector and, and what we've done since the internet boom. I mean, how many different ways of providing people services have emerged that we never could have conceived of in, in 2000? And that happened because you had a critical mass of people thinking about the problem and exchanging ideas. And some ideas came together and they didn't work and they stayed on the napkin and other ideas took off wildly. So. I think a lot of that commercialization is regularly being able to go after opportunities. And with some of the NASA programs that are priming the pump, we know that there are launches and opportunities every year for the next 10 years. Well, that gives us the chance to go and talk to, um, say, a rover company. I work for a lander company, and I go talk to the guys at the rover company. And we talk about, well, how can we work together to find ways to, um, you know, maybe I'll sell a payload on their rover. And that helps them. And I need to know more about how that works. And now we've started talking about, hey, the rover guys have a way to survive the night and not freeze to death on the moon. But I didn't know that until we started talking. So the more opportunities we have for these ideas to come together and interchange and, and to test them and to know that there's an opportunity to follow up and test again, um, that is going to open up capability that makes the commercialization successful. I think, yeah, I, I'll even be a little bit more um, philosophical on this point because it, it, you know, you asked a really great question, Arturo, like what's, this is a very special time. So if you think about it, human beings, you know, this planet's been around for 4.5 billion years. Probably self-aware humans have probably been around for at least a million years. So there's 50, 50 to 100,000, 50,000 generations, and we live at the precise moment where we now have the, the technology and the ability to actually get off this planet. People have been wondering since they looked up at the night sky, the first people, humans that stepped out of the caves looked up and wonder, how does this work? And why are we here? And, and are we alone? And we actually have for the first time the ability to not just, not just to answer those questions, but to actually go and live among the stars. It's, it's really a phenomenal thing to think that we're existing at this time. Um, and, and I think it's been, one, it's been from probably that very first human had that thought. We've been building on each other's shoulders since then, right? Galileo was the first one to put a telescope to his eyes and extend the way the hum humans can, can experience the universe beyond what our senses allow. And really, that's the business we're in, is creating machines that extend human perception and, and our ability to go further and understand more and experience more of the universe. And Good news is we'll never run out of out of out of business because it's a really big universe. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, that is true. 
Yeah, oh. and, and think about to speak about commerce um, specifically. We're seriously thinking about doing civil engineering on the moon. If you're going to land a 30 metric ton habitat at the South Pole, you might want a core sample of what the soil is and decide if you're going to build a 30 metric ton house here, you'd definitely take a core sample and have an engineering firm say, build it here, don't build it on the sand. And so to begin to do things at the moon, which are not just how old is the solar system, which is a great question to serve scientific knowledge, but to now move into resource utilization. Hey, where do I land to make fuel? And then how do I process that fuel? And then how do I make oxygen for life support? All of those things move us into the realm of utilization and commercial opportunity that we can't really describe in full today. Amazing. OPW, that's what I heard. Opportunity, progress, and well-being. That's what, what commercial space, in my mind, as you were talking, you know, I, I guess uh, enables, right? Opportunity, progress, and well-being. Uh, today, again, as uh, we, uh, you know, we have the chance to see this sector grow uh, even farther in the Houston area, uh, for me, it's pretty easy to dissect what's going on and see how you know, the, the new jobs that are being added have an impact down the road, right? With uh, uh, the consumption of goods, uh, gasoline, uh, hotel nights, uh, business, et cetera. It's, it's really good. What, what is happening is something that, um, uh, from our perspective, from Houston's perspective, of course, uh, we cannot pass on, right? I believe that, that uh, the rest of the world should, uh, should definitely engage, uh, you know, to, to the best of their abilities to, to support and to promote uh, commercial space because, uh, as we have seen, it has a, a direct impact in all, all we do, right, today. Um, moving uh, on, uh, let me ask you guys uh, to see if you can help us uh, uh, get your perspective of uh, how is today's uh, industry opening the doors for a generation of the space professionals. Uh, that's, you know, that's what we care about. Well, you know, what, what is there for me to gain, right? People, we think like that, all of us, right? So, so help us understand what, uh, um, what today's industry, you know, what type of doors are we opening? Yeah, I think, you know, generally space is still pretty inspirational. Um, kids like space and robots, I think, is top two. Uh, I was six years old and watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon and I didn't want to do anything else. I actually remember having a feeling of anxiety that here we were putting a man on the moon and I was stuck in the first grade. Um, and, and really, you know, per, that really set me on the trajectory of my life. There was a brief fantasy of playing small forward for the Boston Celtics, but uh, kind of like Tim's base, uh, it didn't work out. But I think, you know, um, the, the cool thing is that it's not just aerospace engineering anymore, right? Um, one of the interesting things, here's another example, um, this bioprinting idea, you can print perfect retinal implants in microgravity. So there's a completely different industry that we're going to need folks to figure out how do, how do we build that machine, how do we fly it, how do we bring it up and down, the raw materials up, and, and then where does that go? Uh, we also need marketing people and, and uh, all those sort of folks, right? It's not just aerospace engineering. And, and I think that's really, um, when we talk about the trillion dollar economy and when I mentioned that we'll be surrounded by objects that we can't imagine how we live without, well, those objects require all kinds of people to, to make and to sell and to, to understand. So I think it's just going to be, I think there, there probably will be um, someone you, in the future, there will be someone you know, someone you're married to that works something in space because it's just going to be so ubiquitous, I think. I definitely agree with the inspirational value. You know, smoke and fire, if we can get inside a seventh grader's head, and, and give them that desire to follow STEM and, and, and to pursue it. Really, whether they stay in space or not, at that point, is irrelevant. They, they become a, a contributor to the technology and the development of our civilization. And that's a good thing. Uh, but more directly, you know, uh, how does this apply today? Well, one example, we're setting up a commercial deep space lunar communications um, system, in part because we misread the requirements. We, <laughs> We kind of thought NASA said they wouldn't help us with something, and we went off, and by the time we realized it wasn't quite that harsh, well, we'd already had the dishes put together. So, 
Um, but if you have a lunar communications network, um, there are a lot of telecommunication companies here on Earth that have a ton of different business models and way they do their um, instantiation of those systems, the way they operate, maintain, upgrade, then how do they play between um, different levels of an ecosystem. So reaching back and saying, hey, now that we're doing things in space, how do we engage with the terrestrial companies that have some analog to what we're doing? Leverage what they know, combine it into, into new forms and form partnerships um, in ways you wouldn't imagine. I mean, just little strange things we see every day. We, um, we couldn't find a fine enough mesh on the intake to our propulsion system. So we have liquid methane that goes through this, this drain that basically pulls the, the, the fuel into the engine. And you don't want bubbles to get into your liquid methane engine, I can tell you that much. Uh, so we, we wanted this fine mesh. Well, we couldn't find an aerospace manufacturer who could make the mesh. But we found a jeweler who could because the screens that the jewelers use to, to screen out some of the particles from their um, high quality workshops was exactly what we needed. And so reaching out by doing these commercial activities and finding other companies that are doing things is, uh, uh, it's gonna change the way we work for sure. And I'll, I'll say it's from, from, I agree with, with Matt and everybody that the, the inspirational part is one that you can't quite measure, but it's probably the most profound impact of our, our space exploration and it just continues mankind's quest to go further and do more and drive our species forward. I, I was a kid in Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica, so I was born in a very rural part of Jamaica. No TV, no electricity, no running water. But our teacher, I was telling this in the green room, my teacher read the, the telemetry to Houston out of the paper every day. And I was instantly crystallized in my mind that whatever it took, I was getting off that island and I was getting to this place called Houston. And I couldn't figure out why, by the way, rocket scientists all had cowboy accents. I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> now I know. But um, it, it's, it's it, it, you know, what we need to do going forward is it's very hard to, to explain the impact that it, the potential impact. In fact, I think it's anybody who thinks they understand impact is, is kidding themselves. Um, some of the things that we do have such direct, are, are, you know, Matt mentioned some medical advances. Space is the most unforgiving environment that humans try to exist in. So by definition, you have to create um, countermeasures that, that you, you to, to survive that are actually much more challenging than the problems we have on Earth. So whether it's surviving in a radiation environment that has an immediate impact on oncology and, and radiation treatments on Earth, or osteoporosis, osteoporosis or ocular degeneration, and we combat all those things. We now have crews coming back from space, by the way, that are in better shape than when they left. That, that was not true 20 years ago. I mean, Bob Benkin came back and he told me, this is really weird, like two days ago I was a hero splashing down, you know, in SpaceX, now my wife wants me to take garbage out. It's really weird. <laughs> So it's, 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 it's progress, but we have some real challenges ahead of us that we're going to have to solve too. And, um, you know, some of them, we've talked about a little bit about resource utilization, utilization on the moon, creating clean power. Uh, we, we recycle today on the International Space Station about 85% of the uh, water and consumables. We're going to need to get pretty close to 100% in order, because you can't carry all that stuff to Mars with you. So those have immediate impact on some of the most challenging problems we have on Earth. Another one that would maybe surprise people is, um, we, if you ever watch a movie, Apollo 13 or anything, things go bad, they call back to Houston, a bunch of smart people get a cuddle around and solve the problem, right? Everybody lives, movie ends happily. At Mars, the travel time for light is 40 minutes. So that doesn't work, it turns out. You're, they're, they're dead before you can call Houston and get an answer. So we have to put artificial intelligence in situ with the crew, and so we are driving with the, you know, along with so many other companies that are they're really pushing that arena, um, that particular technology. We're, we're really pushing that because it's necessary to do deep space exploration where you're way, and it has, and, and all of that, the medicine, the the consumables, everything has immediate impact to any environment on Earth that's austere and remote, and and you know has very many some of the same challenges. So. Um, yeah, I think it's just a, just amazing opportunities going forward. And it really does put you into a, a conservation mindset. Exactly. Right? Everything you've got, uh, the resources that you have or what you take with you or what you can find when you get there. Our company went with a liquid oxygen, liquid methane propulsion system in part because we see in the future methane is a fuel that you can manufacture in situ at the moon, at Mars. 
In fact, all the NASA trade studies, the only way you come back from Mars is by converting CO2 in the Martian atmosphere to methane for propellant. So thinking about how do I do more closed systems engineering where to do this process that uses a raw material that creates a byproduct, it creates a byproduct that I can then use for this other process and maximize how much we do closed loop systems. You know, that thinking, um, I think it'll help play back on, on some of the, the systems we do here when we're thinking about taking care of the environment on Earth. So we, we were talking in, in a green room, we were talking about, you know, everybody wants to know about the potty questions on the, the International Space Station. But the more interesting question is the one of, of what Tim's talking about, is about actually being environmentally conscious. You can't actually go outside and go, go down the street and buy more water. You've got what you got, and you're going to live for six months with it. So we literally recycle, obviously, wash water, gray water. We recycle human urine. We, re we even pull the perspiration out of the air and recycle it and drink it. So it's, it's a pretty, it's the most intense laboratory to figure out how to, how to achieve sustainable living, clean energy, all the things that we're very concerned with. I'll give you a fun fact. So uh, this coming week we're flying a zero-G flight. So uh, it's a special airplane that flies these parabolas. You get 20 seconds of zero-G. And we're flying two um, potty uh, prototypes. And it turns out that uh, mashed sweet potatoes is the best poop simulant. <laughs> well, there you have it. Don't say you didn't learn anything at South by Southwest. <laughs> you you, you learned something. Yes, sir. There you go. <laughs> you guys, um, Matt, um, I, I got to tell you this, and Tim, uh, you know, I go back again uh, 10 years uh, with uh, thinking of your companies, right? And uh, between the two companies, I uh, remember possibly having a couple of dozen people working for the companies. Today, as you, you stand here with a workforce behind you, almost 500 people or more maybe by now, strong, right? Uh, that's great opportunity, right? And, and we are very, very uh, glad, very glad to have, to have you in Houston. And uh, um, I'm making that connection because the, the next question is one for which, of course, I have the answer. Right, but I want to hear. I want to hear what you guys think. How how is that Houston is prime to be the center of much of the action that we're seeing? Right, to me, to me, it's always people. People makes the difference. Without people, you have no companies. Right, and and uh, uh, when I look at Houston, right, when I look at the university uh, universities that we have across the area, around the area, and uh, and the number, just the sheer number of people. Uh, becoming part of our city, it becomes pretty easy to understand that for companies doing business in Houston, it just makes sense to be there. Why? Because uh, having easy, easy access to talent uh, is just, uh, you know, uh, something that, that uh, I guess uh, you can put it on the side and not be worried about how is it that you're going to build your, your projects, how is it that you're going to get it done. You need to have the smart, you need to have those human resources, and we're very strong in that. Uh, again, uh, besides uh, the human resources uh, being in the center of a, uh, the fourth largest city in, in the U.S., it's just a, a tremendous advantage for companies like uh, yours, right, and, and others doing business uh, around the, the Houston area. We, we have, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, assembled in, in many years now, right, the conditions that are, you know, I, I guess, the perfect, the perfect combination to make any type of enterprise, any type of activity. That's from my perspective, right? That, that's what we have in Houston. But I'd like to, to hear, you know, what you think. How is it that we are from? What is, why, why is it that you're choosing Houston as a place to do business? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, certainly for us, uh, being close to the Johnson Space Center is important. Johnson Space Center is the home of human space flight, and we're putting humans in space. And so access to that um, um, capability is important. The Houston spaceport also, so we can build our modules there, we're connected to the airport, we can then fly them down to Florida, put them on a SpaceX or Blue Origin launch vehicle and get them to space. So that is an important piece. But then, as you said, Arturo, it is really all about people and talent, and, and Houston has a lot of talent. Um, in my 28 years at NASA, I had a chance to be around a lot of really smart people and part of really talented teams. But I think the team that we're putting together, and we're, we were 17 employees two years ago, and we're now over 400, most of those in engineering. 
Um, I think it's one of the best teams that I've been around because it's relatively diverse. It's not just aerospace. We have oil and gas folks, petrochem folks. I got a software person that uh, wrote software for ATM machines. Turns out that you got to get that right, so he's a pretty good <laughs> software person. Um, and so I think that diversity of thought, it also helps us think about problems differently. You know, as old aerospace guys, sometimes you, you see the world in a certain way and, and you really need to see it differently. And so having the diversity that Houston brings, uh, I think is really, really important. Um, and then, you know, low cost of living, no state tax, all those things help recruit folks from uh, outside of Texas. Yeah. I. I I've long held that Houston's one of the great cities, and, and maybe 20 years ago you wouldn't have said that. I know when I moved from Austin to Houston 20 years ago, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but the city has uh, worked on itself in the last 20 years, and as a place now, it is one of the most diverse cities in the world. Um, logistically, you can get from Houston to anywhere in the United States in a single flight. Uh, we have a great university system, and with the, the partnerships that are forming now, the Johnson Space Center is making it a priority to interact with companies in the space community in Houston. So anyone in the audience, uh, you know, if, if you're wanting to get into the space game, Sam Gunderson's here from the partnership office, and there's a, a team of people there who are encouraged to out, reach out to you and find ways, if, if, if you've got the passion and you've got business to do and you need help with the, the space program, uh, they'll put you in touch with the right people. And, and so it's more open now than it's ever been for both the city and for NASA to support companies who don't work in, in space there. And so, um, you know, you, you put all those ingredients together, the opportunities um, are really endless, and, and it's, the place, it's the place to be. So Houston is not going to be the Silicon Valley of space. We're way more blue collar than that. Right? We're, I don't know, maybe it's the... the the, the space by you, right? We got to brand it somehow, <laughs> true. But the same kind of leadership in a community in, in that place, being able to reach out um, in, into Texas Medical Center, some of the things they do uh, inspire us in the space program all the time. So I think we're reaching a critical mass where um, I'd go up against, you know, any of the other innovation hubs um, for space and I'd pick Houston. Yeah, I, I agree completely with the thoughts of, the, the, the energy sector doing incredible things. It's not like the 60s where we invented everything ourselves. There's mm -hmm. incredible research in the energy sector. Grace and I were talking about that and our partnerships with our with the leading energy companies in the world. Same thing with the medical sector and, as you said, university systems. So there is critical mass there. I do want to make sure I'm, I'm really clear, though, that when we talk about Houston being the center, the hub of human space exploration, we literally mean a hub with spokes, right? So we intend to be um, connect, trying to be the connector of what's going on in Boca Chica and what's going on here in Austin with all the high technology investments and up in Dallas, you know. And so it's, it's really about convening that community around Houston. And, and so the, it's, it's not just Houston, but why would Houston be the center of it? And I think it's for the reasons we just mentioned, the 60-year history uh, that lies there of not the knowledge base. And as we get more companies like Axiom, like Intuitive Machine, like the Spaceport, the great investment and support we've had from Greater Houston Partnership, the city, um, Mario and, and Arturo's support vision. It's all really um, kind of coalesced to make a, a very powerful hub, but we do want to keep those spokes in mind. We want everybody to see us as a resource. And I, I'll echo what Tim said. It is absolutely the mission of NASA, as I said in the beginning, to not just watch but to enable, foster, curate the success of this space, um, com space community and space economy on behalf of the United States government. That's our job. Um, one, thing, one further thing that I think is hard to measure, why Houston? I've worked in a lot of, you know, in aerospace and in different industries. I've worked at a lot of NASA centers. The thing that's unique about Johnson Space Center, and it's, it's, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a Texas culture thing, but it certainly is a clear like Houston thing is, I promise you, every one of us have kids that go to school with astronauts' kids. I promise you, we go to church with our astronauts. It's not some esoteric idea to us that he's got some, some you know, heroes flying in space. These are our friends. These are our family. We take this business really, really seriously. And if we lose people, it's very profound. So it's hard to get that kind of ethos in a community if you're not there living and working with the, with the people who actually you know, sit on top of the eight million pound 
weapon, ex literally, that is um, an eight million pound bomb that's going into space. It's a very, um, very sobering uh, exercise, and to, to be a part of that community is is something special. Spokes is an interesting, that's an interesting thought, Doug, because the, the lemonade from the lemons of the pandemic too, it, it forced at what is a tra traditional sector in transition. We had to work remote with some people too. So even though I have to bolt and test the physical systems in Houston, because the lander has to come together, you can't do that on a, a virtual teleconference. Um, it has made us though more nimble at, hey, I've got a, I've got a pocket of um, space mechanisms engineers in Maryland that now work very closely with us. And so we are able to tie those spokes in and find places to say, hey, the centroid this activity is here in Houston, but we'll bring the talent in from around the, around the world, really, where we need it. And we've had great success. Um, you know, before the pandemic, I would have insisted you had, you, know, you had to move to Houston. Well, yeah, that went out the window. So um, you know, I think those, that idea of spokes around a centroid is a very great analogy. Well, uh, we're left with one minute to conclude here, but uh, one thing that I wanted to remind you, the city of Houston, the region, right, the Houston spaceport, we're poised for a lot more uh, success, right? Uh, I believe that, that it is very important to, to mention that the federal government, the state government, the county government, the local government stands behind this development that is happening in Houston, specifically at the Houston spaceport, and so, uh, you, you can rest assured that as you move forward with your uh, plans to one day uh, move your companies, uh, you know, do, do your plans in Houston, uh, you have a place where you're uh, gambling in the right way. Uh, hopefully, uh, you guys uh, uh, enjoy the, the panel. I want to uh, ask you please, uh, please for a you know, round of applause for the panel here. Thank you. And, um, if you have any, sorry that we missed the questions. If, if you have any questions, please, we'll be in the back and we'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.